Thank you for joining us tonight. We will be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Thank you for those who've joined online that you're with us as well. Last week, um, the idea of Jesus coming again was introduced at the end of chapter 4. We looked at verses 13 through 18. Uh, there was a question evidently from the church in Thessalonica that Timothy brought, and their question was perhaps something like, will those who die in Christ before his return lose their right to the benefits and the blessings of the second coming? And so Paul deals with that question. Uh, but this passage uh, was not intended to tell us everything about the second coming. The fact that that the topic is being discussed, discussed causes us uh, to think of all the parts of, of that topic that we have not yet found an answer to. Uh, and Paul is going to have to deal with that particular idea as well in chapter 5. But he's concerned uh, with the, the righteous dead uh, and those who remain until the coming of Christ. And so he talks about that subject. That's what... Um, he's looking at. And though the resurrection of the unjust will take place, that is, those who are evil are going to be resurrected as well. Paul doesn't talk about that. That's not his topic here. Uh, in chapter 5, Paul shifts from that specific question about Christians who've died uh, before Christ's return, and he, he talks, uh, uh, gives, perhaps you might say, a general reminder and encouragement about the significance of Christ's second coming, what we call often the parousia, uh, which is his presence or his arrival. And there are two key concepts that, uh, that Christians have considered uh, on this theme of the second coming of Christ. The first is the possibility that Christ could return at any time, okay? The second is the possibility his return will take longer than as people expect or hope. Sometimes you hear people pray Maranatha. What does that mean? Come quickly. And so sometimes uh, we would like his coming to be more quickly uh, approaching us than uh, it would be uh, from our perspective in the time of Paul wrote. It's been 2,000 years. And, and, and sometimes we might look at that and say, well, it would have been nice if it had been sooner. But God has his plan and his way, and he knows why he's doing it like this. However, those two ideas, that he could return at any time, but may not when we hope or desire, um, is, is part of what he's going to talk about in chapter 5, because he's going to help them uh, to realize who they are and how who they are is connected uh, to the second coming. And he uses a, a theme of the day, okay? Normally when we read of the day of the Lord, for example, we think of what? First day of the week, we assemble on the first day of the week and we remember Christ in the Lord's Supper. What are some other things you think of when you think of the day of the Lord? Judgment. Judgment. For example, you might see the judgment in 70 AD as the coming of Christ uh, on a particular uh, day to bring judgment on, on that nation. So the, the phrase by itself has to be taken in context. And in this context, because he uses that word parousia, uh, as well as the word the day or the expression the day, we know he's talking uh, about Christ's coming, uh, his return. And he wants them uh, to realize that who they are at that time is connected to that day. And he tells them that they are sons of what? Do you remember anything about that? Sons of what? We need to look at that text. That's where we're going to be then. We will answer that question because Paul here talks about who they are, sons uh, and daughters, uh, of essentially two things in this context, but uh, we'll look at it uh, in more detail. They are sons of light and sons of day. As a child of the light, the Christian 
uh, is assured that there is uh, confidence in looking to the day that is coming. Uh, Christians know um, that when Christ returns again, uh, that they are under his grace and saved by his blood. Uh, and because they know what the future hold, holds, it should have an impact on them. And that's what Paul's going to focus on here. He'll talk about three characteristics of the children of light. Three things that will help them to prepare for when Christ comes again. He says, look forward to the day of the Lord's return. Do you remember when you last thought about this idea, Maranatha? I'm looking forward to the Lord's return. A couple hours ago, last time I saw the news headlines. <laughs> we each have, you know, those events in our our day, our, our month that, that point us to that idea. Uh, and Paul is saying, this is something that you will benefit from doing on a more regular basis, looking for the, the day of the Lord's return. The second thing is, uh, he encourages them to love those who labor among them. And finally, he, he ends this, the, this letter, this chapter, with the idea, live joyfully. And this is all connected to the second coming uh, of Christ. So he's encouraging in our lesson today that the children of light look forward uh, to Christ's return. And the reason for looking to this day is it will encourage them and help them to be ready, okay? In, in what way do we need to be ready for the Lord's return? Hmm. We don't know when he's coming. So what do we have to be ready for? Make sure we're in Christ. Yes. Have you ever known any people that fell away from Christ? If you told them tomorrow the Lord's returning, do you think it would make a difference? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. What if they believed that he was returning? Maybe it would. Uh, but most importantly, I think what he's talking about is how to keep those who accept the idea and the teaching of the, the coming of Christ uh, to be more um, devoted and committed to that idea and to protect them against uh, the, several, the devil's tools and his tendency to distract us. Uh, Satan wants to get us away from Christ however he can. And Paul, writing to the church in Thessalonica, knows that they've had a lot of problems. Uh, they came to Christ in the midst of conflict and fights. In fact, you remember Paul was run out of town. Uh, and so he's wanting to remind them, as he has done previous to this, of those things that will help them to stay steadfast. And this is one of the things that he encourages them to do, to, to remain um, ready when Christ comes by reminding themselves that he is coming, okay? So that we'll look uh, in, in chapter 5 and we'll look at verses 1 through 11, Lord willing, if that works out. And please join me. Let's, let's say a word uh, especially about this study. Father, we thank you for the kindnesses that you have given to us today. We thank you, Father, that we have your word and that you uh, have brought it to us through uh, your gracious care and, and direction that faithful people over the ages have passed it on to us that we might know your will uh, concerning so many things. But especially today, the letter that we have from Thessalonica uh, that Paul wrote to help us to be encouraged uh, in anticipation of your son's return. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity um, that we have for this word to be in our hearts and our minds, and Father, that it will affect us in a way by the influence of your spirit, those who are around us, uh, and the circumstances in this life to see the truth and the blessing of knowing and, and living according to your word. Father, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, if you will, follow with me in... First Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 5, I'll be, re be reading from the New American Standard Version. And he says to them, starting in verse 1, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, 
then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will uh, live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another uh, and build up one another, just as you are also uh, doing. Paul begins in verse 1 uh, with two words that maybe we don't hear too often. He says, now as to the times and epochs. That's New American Standard. If you have uh, the NIV, it's going to say times and dates. Is that correct? Uh, if you have the New King James Version, it's going to say times and seasons. Uh, these are words that are used typically in discussions of what is known as eschatology. Does anybody know what eschatology is? End times. It's that tology that talks about the end times. Huh? Eschatology. So those, those words are often found in that kind of discussion. Uh, and it is, in fact, what Paul's going to be talking about in, in uh, pointing to the coming of Jesus and, and actually the judgment uh, that is part of that. So when, when we look at this um, expression, uh, times, it's, it's translated from chronos, uh, from which we get our English word chronology. And uh, the second word is kairos uh, uh, in, in uh, that translation, which mine has as epic. But the words by themselves, uh, though they may have some distinct uh, meaning independent of one another, typically these two go together uh, to, to remind people uh, of the judgment. They probably don't have a, a big distinction here. Uh, in, in the way that they are used. Um, but the point of them is that people were worried about times and epics, times and dates, meaning they're worried about what? When? When is he coming? What's going to happen? You know, uh, we could just put it on our calendar. You know, it's going to happen on the such and such a day. And so uh, if we knew when he was coming, how might it affect us? I mean, literally. How might it affect us if we knew what day he was coming? What would we think of evangelism and sharing the gospel? Would that become more important to us, perhaps? Yeah, why spend our time on other things that are not going to affect people's destiny if we knew on such and such a date that he was coming, okay? Uh, but we don't know that. Uh, and because they are concerned about that subject, he brings up uh, the word and the, the two together in order to prepare for his discussion. But he says something interesting to them uh, there in verse 1 about times and epics or times and days. He says what? To start out, what does he tell them? No, there's no need to write to you about this. Uh, and it goes back to what probably Paul had already taught them. Now, if you're reading in the Gospels, you're going to come across something that Jesus says. And what does Jesus say? as they're asking him about the temple, when it's going to be destroyed, you know, when is his return, and he tells them, nobody knows. I don't know. The only one who knows is the Father. So they already probably know that, because he's probably already taught them about that. And so he doesn't really have any need to write them about times and epics. Uh, and uh, he'd use the same expression when he talked about love, he said he had, um, in, in chapter 4, verse 9, no need to write to them about love. Do you remember why? He said, you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. 
okay? So they had already been taught on, on that subject, and he didn't need to teach them again. Not only that, he says they're doing quite well in it, uh, though he encourages them to do more. But the same idea is here. Um, people are asking about times and epics, and then he reminds them, well, you don't really need uh, to be taught again about that particular uh, subject or application of the second coming. Uh, so it reminded me to go online and look and see when was the most recent prediction about Christ's return. It's kind of hard to find, you know, because if you make a prediction and he doesn't show up, what do you do? <laughs> you delete you delete your tweet or your Instagram or whatever uh, so that uh, people don't know. However, I found a, a prediction from January 18, 2017. Rabbi Yosef Berger of King David's tomb in Mount uh, Zion, Jerusalem, and he predicted that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, might return in 2022. And guess what? It's 2023, uh, and they haven't scrubbed it yet. It's still there. Um, so based on his research uh, with astronomers, he saw that two large stars were going to collide and create a visible light from uh, such a great distance that people could see it on Earth. And they took that as some indication uh, that it would pinpoint, pinpoint the, the time when when uh, Christ would return. That's an odd one. It, it, to me, it was odd that a rabbi would do that. Um, but it's odd to me that they would think that two stars colliding uh, would be a sign to the second coming of Jesus. But people have to take something if they're going to make a prediction. Uh, time setters have occurred in practically every age. What are some of the common reasons that, that cause them to predict that Jesus is coming soon? Nice weather on the weekend. Friendly neighbors in another country. <laughs> no, if there's a war, or as Jesus said, a rumor of wars, if there's an earthquake, what do we have? People saying the, it's the end, the Lord's coming. And that's why we get a little desensitized to it although there are certainly a lot of books being sold, uh, we have a need in our day and age to pay attention to what he wrote here, okay? Because of the fact that uh, it's still occurring. In verse two of chapter five, um, Paul explains how the day of the Lord will come. What does he say there? As a thief in the night, what does that mean? Un yeah, <laughs> unexpected. Th this is not an unusual expression. Uh, Peter, we looked at last week, uh, and second, in, in his le letters talked about it, but specifically in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, 9 and 10, um, Peter says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. So we get some insight here. What, what, what might be a reason for delay? Yeah, not everybody's come to repentance. We don't know how that's ex determined, what that means uh, in, in precise definition. But we have Peter saying uh, that God's not slow. He, he's got a reason for what he's doing. Uh, but if you're going to talk about the day of the Lord, it will come like a thief. He repeats that same idea. Paul adds, while people, uh, um, well, that, that the Lord's going to come while people are saying peace and safety. What's that talking about? People are saying peace and safety, and while they're saying that, the Lord comes. What does that idea suggest to you? Yeah, we're doing just fine. It's going to come on a day when people are thinking we're doing just fine. Uh, if you went and talked to, to Noah and a few of those people, some of their neighbors are probably thinking, we're doing just fine. You're wasting your time building that big boat. Uh, and it's probably true today. You ask people, are you concerned about the second coming of the Lord? A lot of them will say what? Nah. 
Yeah, no, uh uh-uh. I'll I'll be going about my own business if he comes. Uh, And so he he uses that expression um, to describe a culture where everything appears ordinary, uh, the people seem comfortable with with what's going around them, uh, and this um, idea of peace and safety is is just how they anticipate uh, their day to go. Uh, so he also uses another figure of speech, not only the thief in the night, which we have seen, or that, that, that there's peace and safety, but the next figure that he uses is the, the illustration or the metaphor of a woman in labor, a woman with child in labor. What does that bring across? Is that something that's a very powerful metaphor today? When you think of that as a metaphor, Uh, a woman with child, how does that point to you the coming of Jesus? Not so powerful to us, huh? Pardon me? Okay, she never knows. And when it happens, guess what? You don't have much time. You don't have much time. That's probably the idea. Uh, And those people who work with Uh, that area of um, medical care probably recognize it. You you don't have much time, it's going to come suddenly, you might not expect it uh, when it does. And so he's taking these metaphors, people saying peace and safety is just like a normal day, Uh, it's going to come like a thief, not when they're expecting it, Uh, and it's going to be like a woman with child that will come swift and suddenly. Uh, And so through these images, Um, Paul is saying that's the way the second coming of Christ will be, all right? Yes, this is exactly the idea. That's what he's trying to get across to them. You don't, there's no reason to worry about the date and the time. The thing to be concerned about is be ready. So that's where he's headed with this whole thing. He wants them to get the right perspective uh, on the coming of Christ and, and that uh, day that um, he uses these metaphors to describe. And so in his letter to the Thessalonians, uh, Paul will reason with them, because you know perfectly well that you don't know the time uh, and that it will come swiftly, uh, it won't be pre-announced, uh, you need to continue to be prepared. You need to continue to be prepared. This is uh, the idea that Paul was, was, ta- was sharing with us. Um, th- these metaphors tell us it's not something we can put off and put off and put off. You hear the trumpet, guess what? It's too late to do anything else. Uh, if you hear the shout of the angel, oops, it's too late. Okay, so... Um, he, he wants them then, if, if we go on from here, he wants them to focus on the idea of being uh, prepared. Paul links uh, together the doctrine of the second coming and the way that you live, all right? Um, this is n- not an unusual relationship. Um, we saw last week that, that uh, the Apostle Peter said something similar, but that this time in Uh, 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 12, and I'd like us to read it again. He connects the fact that Christ is coming again to the kind of morality or the way of life that we should have. So listen to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of the Lord and speed its coming. That's where we get the idea, God's speed, right? Speed its coming. Paul's point is is consistent with, with Peter. The fact that Jesus is coming needs to have an effect on the way that we live. If we don't think about Jesus is coming again, if we don't think about the, the impact it should have on our lives, what are we missing? We're missing the point, okay? Yeah? Uh, it, it might be a reason for 
uh, for us to, to think about this a little bit more. How do I make it real in my life? Uh, how do I take to heart the message that Paul here was writing to the church in Thessalonica? He believed, if he reminded them uh, that the Lord is coming again, that that would have an impact on the way that they lived. Okay? So perhaps we need, uh, in our time when we're reading the scriptures, uh, towards our goal of reading through the Bible in a year, we might want to think about these things. How do we make this real in my life? One of the challenges I have in, in reading this, um, this schedule from the Old Testament is I'll come to something just like you said, and I'm thinking, now what does that little thing mean? And then I got to jump over and start researching it, and pretty soon I'm thinking, I'm running out of time. <laughs> I need to read this. But if we don't take time to apply what we're reading, then it's not going to have the benefit that, that we intend. In fact, the sermon becomes a challenge to apply what we just read in the week before. Uh, and so one of the things about uh, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, this would be a good thing to go home and think about. Uh, what is Paul saying here that has an impact on my life and how can that uh, help me uh, to be better prepared? Um, he gives in verses four through seven, a contrast in life and practice. Do you remember what the two contrasts are? We just, we didn't read it uh, very slowly. We just kind of jumped through it. Do you remember what the two contrasts were? Day and night. And there's another one. Light and dark. Day and night, light and dark. Those, that's what he uses to help describe um, the, the Christian life and anticipation of the coming of Christ. Uh, so he, he makes a distinct separation between those who are believers who live in a state of expectancy uh, who seek to live according to the light and the unbelieving world which lacks this sense of expectancy they they don't believe in him why would they have a sense of expectancy and he's going to show that because they don't anticipate or expect the coming of the lord like peace and safety peace and safety they are kind of lulled um, into a sense of complacency. Do we use that word lulled very much? Lulled. Yeah, we hear lullaby every now and then. Uh, I find myself saying words that if I was in Slovakia, everybody would be staring at me like, what's that about? Uh, and so maybe the idea there is to, we lullaby, is we sing a lullaby for what reason? To put them to sleep, to lull them to sleep. And so that's the idea here. The idea is that um, complacency uh, is, a, is something that causes us not to pay attention to what is urgent uh, and important. So in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4, he says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. Those metaphors that he gave, he said, no, that's not about you. It's about those uh, who are unbelievers. The word darkness often appears uh, in passages having to do with the last things. Uh, the word is, is used when Paul wants to describe the condition of the unbeliever, for example. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, he writes, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness but instead even expose them okay uh this one's a hard one isn't it uh it's one thing to to stay away from something it's another thing to expose it okay uh this might be particularly beneficial for people in the church uh some things that are contrary to god's word um maybe promoted by the world of darkness if it creeps in, we might need to expose it. We need, might need to point it out in order to help people avoid the, the conflict um, that Paul is describing here. So, uh, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. In what way are the deeds of darkness 
unfruitful. Pardon me? Pretty much in all the ways. Give, give me an example. Unfruitful means what? Not bearing any fruit. There are no consequences to living in the dark. There are consequences, but he's talking a, kind, a specific kind of fruit here. It's called what? <laughs> fruit of the poisonous tree. In Galatians chapter 5, it's called the deeds of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. Okay, so it, it is fruit. It's just a bad kind of fruit uh, that he's talking about here. So there are definitely consequences to living the dark life, to, to following the path of this darkness. Uh, it, it's just that it's not fruitful in the sense that we're talking about when we speak of the fruit of the Spirit or those things which are going to lead to eternal life. So, your parents said nothing good happens at night. Uh, I've heard that expression before. Yeah, heard that expression before. Uh, our whole culture has changed a bit because we're often not leaving, even leaving our houses, you know, uh, let alone going out at night. When I used to, to leave late uh, in Bratislava from our office, which is on the south, south part of, of Bratislava, um, I could catch until 11 o'clock a bus or streetcar um, every 8 to 15 minutes. After 11 o'clock, it's every three hours. Uh, and so when we would have our devotional, I would ask them at the beginning, does everybody know when their 11 o'clock bus is? Uh, so, because I can't take you all home. So, you know, I booted them out. If they couldn't walk there, they needed to get out in time to catch the last bus. Now, the buses all went to the train station, no matter where you were, they went to the train station. From there, you switch to whichever bus went into your neighborhood. That's like, you know, every three hours, you're going to be waiting somewhere a long uh, time. But there were times when I had to walk. And in Bratislava, in order to save money, they would turn off the lights in a certain segment of the town. I mean, all the lights except in your house. Uh, if it's an outside utility light, they shut it off. And that just kind of rotated around. Uh, and I remember walking. It's a city of, oh, how many? Almost 500,000 people. And I'm walking down the street with a bunch of other people, and it's so dark you can barely see what's going on, and nobody's worried about it. So that was a time and a place where people didn't think that way, you know? Uh, we're saving money. Okay, it's dark. There are not very many cities of 10,000 people. I mean, I walk from here to home uh, in the dark frequently. And there have been some strange characters. Tell you what, not too long ago, I'm walking, you know, down here to the next street, 6th, and someone yells at me, the real loud voice. And I turn around and look, and they're back in the trees in the shadow. Uh, who are you? Who is that? And I turn around, they said, oh, you're not who I expected. And I thought, what do I do? Do I keep going? <laughs> do I come back to the building? What's going on? So I just continued walking, and pretty soon I hear feet running up behind me, running, running. And the guy runs to my side, and he looks at me. Uh, and of course, I keep walking, and he immediately goes in front of me, and then goes down a side road. And I'm thinking, why did he do that? He didn't have to. And then as he's going down the side road, he's turning back looking at me like, you should go this way. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? <laughs> Walk down that dark alley. So I went down to the next street, which has a light, and I looked up the street, and there he was running across to the next alley. But we, we have our own experiences of the metaphor of darkness. And, uh, walking around in places where it is dangerous. And Paul wants us to see that spiritually, this metaphor uh, describes a dangerous condition, that people who are living this life of darkness, who are following um, the deeds of darkness, are going to meet the Lord 
uh, on that day. And on that day, it will be too late to change. So he reminds the church in Thessalonica, brethren, you are not in darkness. You are not in darkness. Uh, he says, verse 4, the day, uh, that, that the day would overtake you like a thief. Uh, that day that Christ returns is not going to overtake them like a thief. Overtake has the idea of what? Surprise you, yeah. And this is going to be a negative surprise, you know. Uh, it's like the, the, the Jews who uh, said that they wanted, that they were willing to take upon themselves the responsibility for the death of Jesus. And then when it came around, you're responsible for this. No, 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 too late. Uh, we can't avoid it on that day. So the word darkness um, does appear in passages that have to do uh, with the last days. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, there's another passage, uh, chapter 4, verse 17 through 19, where Paul writes, So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity and greed, greediness. And so Paul points out here a, a pretty... Uh, unpleasant uh, scenario uh, that if you be become a Christian out of the Gentile lifestyle, um, don't continue to walk that way. He says that they walk in the futility of their mind. Futility of their mind means what? Useless? It's not producing perhaps what they might expect. Uh, he says because they're darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they become calloused, all right? Uh, giving themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness. Um, so this idea of darkness and light and, and darkened being a, a, a metaphor uh, of, of those who are unbelievers is clarified a little bit about what it really means. Um, and it's certainly something to avoid. So the word darkness describes a condition of life, uh, a life that's not enlightened, as we might say, uh, by the person of Christ. By contrast, the Christian is urged to walk in the light. First uh, John chapter 1, verse 7, uh, walk in the light as he is in the light. And if you walk in the light as Christ is in the light, as a Christian, what can you expect? Fellowship with God, because normally God is light and he cannot fellowship what is dark. And so he's trying uh, in First John to uh, inform us um, that that metaphor uh, shows a difference in who has fellowship and who does not have fellowship. And if we walk in the light and have fellowship with God, what does he promise about the blood of Christ? He continuously cleanses us. That's an interesting idea. It, he continually cleanses us. So this focusing on light versus darkness should have an opportunity to remind us that we have fellowship with God. And do we really want to take him where we're about to go? Do we really want him to hear and see what we're about to do? Uh, and so if it is our desire, if it's our goal to walk in the light as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Uh, now, if we fail, yeah. So let me, let me summarize this. So we're talking about relationship here. The relationship with God that's important. So Paul points us to, uh, to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, where the group of people came uh, to Jesus, uh, and they're calling him Lord. 
And he says, I don't know you. And they remind him, well, we, we did all of these miracles and signs and everything. And he said, I don't know you. There was no relationship there, fellowship relationship. Uh, and he doesn't, Jesus doesn't say in that text that what they claimed was true. He didn't say it was true. He just says that they said it, yes? Okay, so the idea here that we're talking about from 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and following, is the idea wanting to have that relationship and wanting to walk with him. Okay, so this is an important idea. And Paul, of course, um, has all of that background as well. And he's dealing with a specific concern that they have with the point of trying to encourage them. He's not, he doesn't want to make them nervous. He, he wants to encourage them. Uh, and uh, to, to be willing to face the difficulty that is uh, uh, in the part of the world where they're living because they are Christians. And so he says, you are not darkness, that that day when Christ comes should overtake you. Uh, you're not going to be surprised like a thief coming in the night. Um, and in order to, to have that assurance, he's describing them as having a life of vigilance, watchfulness, alertness, uh, not just drifting through their day, but paying attention. In verse 5, he says, For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor darkness. Uh, and in verse 5, Paul uses a Hebrew idiom. It's written in Greek, but the idiom is the idea of who is your father or who is your son. In some cases, it might be who is, is your mother. Uh, and so, um, this, this idiom means you partake of the nature of whomever is your father. If your father is darkness or the devil, then it's, it's describing um, who you uh, are following after, who you are, are becoming like. Paul is saying that we are sons of light, and, and that truth affects how we are to live. God is light, so we, we are to walk in the light. And John argue that as we just uh, just saw in first john we are the offspring of the light and therefore we are to partake of the nature of light that's what it means that we are children of the light the light is our uh, father and so he also says here uh, not only that you are sons of light but sons of day um, the day here can be seen as the day of the second coming He's been talking about that. We might not have thought of it that way. We are sons and daughters. We are children of that day. That day that is coming is our day. And we shouldn't shrink back from that because it's a day of rejoicing and glorification. So we are sons of the day. Um, there is a sense in which Christians' natural habitat is a day that is not here yet a day that is approaching. We are anticipating what will happen when Christ comes again. How will we be different? Well, we'll be raised. If we're alive, we will meet him in the air and we will be what? Perfect. We will be glorified, Paul says to the Colossians. That means whatever his physical body is like, ours will be like. And so he, he says, there's a day out there when Christ is coming. You don't need to be afraid of it or worried about it. It's your day because you're sons of light uh, and you're sons of that day. This is an anticipation of uh, some great things that are going to happen because of, of, of what Christ has already done. So we can look to that day in a real sense as if we are the children of that day. Uh, and, and this Hebrew idiom that, that talks about being sons of the day uh, points to the fact that we will uh, partake of the very nature of that day. We will live um, with one uh, eye on the day that he's coming back uh, and how it will affect us now at this time uh, and partake of the, the nature of that day as we walk and as we continue and as we approach that day. Um, we will influence how we live on the basis of the fact that Jesus is coming on a day. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of, of uh, bringing the future into our now. Because that day, though it is in the future and we don't know when, um, is promised. It's on God's calendar. It's just not on ours. 
Uh, and if we're children of the day, uh, then we have a link to that day through what Christ has done, and we are looking for his return. So Paul continues in verses 5 through 7, We are not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. So he's saying that we should be characterized by the day life, the vigilant, alert, sober, um, have a temperament that is balanced, looking to Christ, expectant anticipation of his coming. Uh, we're not of the darkness, we're of the day. And so he tells us to, to live in a certain way. Uh, let us be alert and sober. Um, we probably uh, have seen the metaphor already and remember it in verses six and seven about sleep. Um, sometimes sleep refers to what in the Bible? It refers to death, okay? Uh, and in this particular case, we aren't dead yet, but perhaps we might be, if we're described by this word sleep, spiritually. So he, he says, um, he, he's really talking about a kind of spiritual dullness or a numbness spiritually uh, when we're asleep. He, 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 he says, he points to the kind of activities that occur at night, people get drunk at night, as we already talked about some of these. Um, he's, he's talking about how the darkness and the night uh, affects the way that a person lives. In, in practical terms, um, he's encouraging us to avoid anything in our practice today that will be harmful for us when we approach um, that day when Christ returns. So he, he ends um, in this section with a reference to our armor. Uh, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So we've, we've seen in other contexts a larger description of armor. But let's close on this idea that um, the emphasis upon watchfulness suggests that we are in a conflict, okay? This is not something that is, is neutral. Uh, there is a conflict going on, and the reason that we need armor is because Satan would be very happy for us to go to sleep. He would be very happy for us to take up those uh, practices that cause us to forget that Christ is coming again. And so we pay attention um, that there is a conflict going on, and Paul was warning them and encouraging them to take those steps that prepare them for the influence that Satan intends to have. And how does he influence us? Well, other people, for example, TV, radio, internet, podcasts, texts, Twitter. There's all kinds of ways he can appear. Not to say that any of those things by themselves are bad, but he's saying you need to be prepared for the fact that you're uh, in a conflict. So you have a breastplate of faith love, and love, and a helmet of salvation. Those things, those three things, those uh, two pieces of armor, tell us something about how we can be prepared. So Lord willing, we'll come back and talk about the remainder of the verses in chapter five uh, and see how this leads into uh, his more detailed discussion of the last day. Any final questions? Any final answers? No? Shall we close in prayer? Father, we thank you for your love and your kindness. We thank you, Father, for this time that we've had to look at uh, Paul's letter to our brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. We ask, Father, for wisdom as we consider our own life, how we can uh, focus on the return of your son and what a great day that will be, and how we can be people who are prepared against the, uh, the actions and the, and the strategies of Satan to, to not be turned away from uh, the path we're on to fulfill uh, the desires that we've had since we became a Christian uh, to be eternally with you. Thank you for 
each one here. And I pray, Father, you will bless us um, to find uh, how we can be used by you to accomplish your will, even today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much.